This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Relevance of Max Stirner to Anarcho-Communists by Maddie Thomas Section 1. Introduction Since the publication of Max Stirner's book Der Einschen und sein Eigentum, translated into English as The Ego and Its Own, or more accurately, The Unique and Its Property, in 1844, reaction has ranged from complete reputation to total uncritical acceptance. Many strange and contradictory things have been said about Stirner. The respected anarcho-syndicalist academic Noam Chomsky has labeled him an influence on the devotees of extreme laissez-faire capitalism, erroneously known in the United States as libertarians. However, there are those who have made Stirner's ideas the very basis of their anarcho-syndicalist organizing. Perhaps such varied interpretations are inevitable when faced with a book that at times seems almost deliberately intended to disturb or disconcert. The goal of this pamphlet is to explore the ideas of the great German thinker and their value to anarcho-communists. Some readers familiar with Stirner will bristle at this immediately, pointing out that Stirner was an outspoken, outspoken critic of communism. He was indeed, but the communism that Stirner critiqued was the same variety of communism that anarchists critique, authoritarian communism. Anarcho-communism, as developed political theory, did not really exist in Stirner's day, and the communism that Stirner had in mind was the communism of the monastery, or of the barracks, a communism of self-sacrifice and general leveling. Those who would instead prefer a communism that guarantees the freedom of each individual to develop themselves as unique can find much that is of value in Stirner. Section 2. Stirner's Ideas Stirner begins his book by asking, what is not supposed to be my concern? He answers that an individual is supposed to be concerned first of God's cause, then humanity's cause, then the cause of the country, of truth, of justice, and a thousand other causes. The only cause that is not supposed to concern the individual is her own cause, the cause of self. My cause is not supposed to be my concern. The person who makes their own cause their concern is a selfish person. Instead, the individual is always told to put another cause before their own. We are to work tirelessly in the service of an other or others, never for ourselves. To think of doing otherwise would make one an immoral egoist. We are moral only when we are unselfish, when we take up a cause alien to us and serve it. Stirner will have none of this. He asks, does God serve a cause other than his own? No, replied the faithful. God is all in all, no cause can ever not be his. Does humanity serve a cause that is not his own? asked Stirner. And the humanists reply, No, humanity serves only the interests of humanity. No cause can ever not be the human cause. The causes of God and humanity both turn out in the end to be purely egoistic. God concerns himself only with himself, man likewise. So Stirner encourages his readers to follow the examples of these great egoists and make themselves the main thing altogether. In other words, to become conscious egoists. For Stirner, all individuals are absolutely unique, and once the individual has become conscious of her egoism, she will reject any attempt to fetter her personal uniqueness or to restrict her individual autonomy. This, of course, includes calls to act only in the service of something higher than oneself. Those who sacrifice themselves to serve some higher being or cause are duped or unconscious egoists, seeking their own pleasure and satisfaction in the name of whatever cause they've subordinated themselves to, but refusing to admit it. They are egoists who would like to not be egoists. Quote, All your doings are unconfessed, secret, covert, and concealed egoism, but because they are egoism that you are unwilling to confess to yourselves, that you keep secret from yourselves, hence not manifest and public egoism, consequently unconscious egoism, therefore they are not egoism, but thraldom, service, self-renunciation. You are egoists, but you are not, since you renounce egoism." End quote. Stirner begins and ends his book by crying, I have set my cause upon nothing. This quotation from Guth would have been familiar to Stirner's contemporary German audience, the unstated next line of the poem is, quote, and all the world is mine, end quote. The self, for Stirner, is something impossible to fully comprehend, because each one of us is constantly consuming and recreating his or her self. Stirner refers to this process of self-consumption and self-creation as the creative nothing. 
Not nothing in the sense of emptiness, but nothing in the sense that I, as creator, create everything. The external causes that are always asking the individuals to put herself last, that treat her as if she were nothing, are now subject to being actively appropriated and used by the egoist as she sees fit. The ego in its own is organized around a three-part dialectical structure. Sterner begins by giving us examples of human life and then compares the three stages of human development to the three stages of historical development. We begin life as realistic children. During this phase, the child is subject to physical, external forces such as his parents. However, the child begins to break free of these constraints through what Sterner calls the discovery of mind. The child, using his wits and determination, begins to evade the purely physical forces which previously kept him in check. In this way, we move from realistic childhood to idealistic youth. The external constraints of the physical no longer hold any terrors for the youth, yet now he is subject to the internal constraints of reason, of conscience, of the ideal. The child is infatuated with the earthly side of life, the youth, the heavenly. Only when one reaches the egoistic adulthood is one free from both external, earthly constraints and the internal, heavenly constraints. Stirner summarizes it thus, quote, As I find myself back of things, and that as mind, so I must find myself also back of thoughts, to wit as their creator and owner. In this time of spirits, thoughts grew till they overtopped my head, whose offspring they yet were. They hovered around me and convulsed me like fever fantasies, an awful power. The thoughts had become corporeal of their own accounts, were ghosts, e.g. God, Emperor, Pope, Fatherland, etc. If I destroy their corporeity, then I take them back into mine, and I say, I alone am corporeal, and now I take the world as what it is to me, as mine, as my property. I refer it all to myself." End quote. Stirner then shows these three phases in the context of historical development, the realistic world of antiquity, the idealistic world of modernity, and the egoistic future which is not yet dawned. He compares the ancient pre-Christian world to realistic childhood and the modern Christian world to idealistic youth. With the rise of secularism, modern society claims to have escaped the dominion of religious modes of thought over life. Not so, says Stirner. Modernity has only served to increase the dominion of religion, the domination of higher essences set over the individual. One example is the Protestant Reformation. While the Reformation is and was widely regarded as a liberatory event, which opened the door for the religion of freedom of conscience and freed life from the authority of the church, Cerner viewed it as an expansion and strengthening of religious domination. Religion was through the Reformation, able to intrude into areas of life where it had previously been unknown. The Catholic Church prevented priests from marrying. Protestantism made marriage, marriage religious. In a similar fashion, the Catholic Church, with its institutionalized formal priesthood, placed religious authority outside of the individual. Protestantism, however, abolishes the institutional clergy in favor of a priesthood of all believers, and so places religious authority within the believer an authority that she could never escape. The result left individuals at war with themselves, torn between fulfilling their desires and being tormented by the fixed ideas of internalized religious authority. Cerner compares it to the struggle between citizens and the state's secret police. This pattern, argues Cerner, has continued throughout modernity. Although there has been much talk of progress and achieving a freer society, of transcending the worn-out values of dead traditions of the past, Modernity only transforms authority, enlarging and strengthening it by virtue of making it more invisible. The rise of humanism, for example, dethroned the crucified God and in his place exalted humanity. But since humanity is also an ideal placed above the individual for her to subordinate herself to, Stirner considers humanism just as much of a religion as the Christianity it claims to have outgrown. Our atheists are pious people. Humanism, says Stirner, is actually more tyrannical than theism because of the phantom humanity. It's able to terrify non-believers along with the faithful. For Cerner, modernity has only increased the amount of abstractions, which he called spooks, to which people subordinate themselves. Cerner accuses those who fancy themselves the free, 
which you might call progressives in today's jargon, of posturing as iconoclasts, when in reality they are only the most modern of moderns. He was highly critical of the left Hegelians dominating German philosophy at the time, and of the liberalism that was rising as the prevailing force in political and social thought. Stirner grouped liberalism into three types. Political liberalism, what would today be called classical liberalism, social liberalism, today socialism, and humane liberalism, today humanism. Political liberalism dealt with individuals as free citizens within a state. Social liberalism dealt with individuals as workers, and humane liberalism with the individuals as human beings. But all of the varieties of liberalism essentialize some aspect of the individual and set it above her as something that they should subordinate themselves to. For Stirner, all individuals are more than citizens, more than workers, and even more than human beings. Human nature, or the human essence, cannot be separated from the individual and set above her, because then it becomes nothing but another spook. For Stirner, there is no universal human essence to be set above people, only individuals as they exist in the here and now as flesh and blood. From his... From his searing critique of modernity, Stirner moves to anticipation for the egoistic future. He urges individuals to demolish all sacred things and free themselves from the chains of authority. This liberation is not something the individual can let someone else do for her. Stirner makes his position clear in one of the most eloquent anarchist arguments for self-liberation ever penned. Quote, Here lies the difference between self-liberation and emancipation. Parentheses, manumission, setting free. Close parentheses. Those who today stand in the opposition are thirsting and screaming to be set free. The princes are to declare their people of age, i.e., emancipate them. Behave as if you were of age and you are so without any declaration of majority. If you do not behave accordingly, you are not worthy of it and would never be of age even by declaration of majority. When the Greeks were of age, they drove out their tyrants, and when the son is of age, he makes himself independent of his father. If the Greeks had waited till their tyrants graciously allowed them their majority, they might have waited long. A sensible father throws out a son who will not come of age, and keeps the house to himself. It serves the noodle, right? <laughs> the man who is set free is nothing but a freed man, a libertinus, a dog dragging a piece of a chain around him. He is an unfree man in the garment of freedom, like an ass in the lion's skin. <laughs> End quote. As more and more people become conscious egoists, they will deny restrictions to their individuality, whether these restrictions are physical or spiritual. It should be pointed out that Stirner's idea of egoism differs significantly from the other philosoph from the other philosophies sometimes called egoism. Stirner was an advocate of self interest, even selfishness but he did not use these terms in the typical narrow way. Stirner was not an apostle of the never-ending pursuit of profit, nor did he preach isolation or use selfishness as an excuse to never give a damn about anyone else. For Stirner, self-interest consisted of the individual egoist actively seizing the world around her as her property. Stirner's use of the word property has caused many readers to misinterpret him, as he was not referring to property in a limited economic sense. Rather, he was using the word to refer to anything that was not alienated from the egoist. Thus, when I take a personal interest in an idea, I reach out and make the idea my own, my property. To the conscious egoist, the only determining factor towards gaining something as one's property is the willingness to reach out and take it. The aim of this active seizure of egoistic property is self-enjoyment. Even other people are, for Stirner, a means for mutual self-enjoyments. Quote, for me, you are nothing but my food, even as I am fed upon and turned to use by you. We have only one relation to each other, that of usableness, of utility, of use. End quote. Those who see Stirner as an advocate of exploiting others fail to read what is written. Stirner uses the examples of lovers, friends going to a cafe, and children at play as examples of this kind of mutual self-enjoyment or consumption relationship that he termed union unions of egoists. A union of egoists is a relationship in which all who participate in it do so freely and voluntarily out of egoism. 
The egoist uses the union, the union does not use her. All participants in the union constantly renew their relationship through an act of will. If any participant is coming up short or losing out, then the union has degenerated into something else. The union was Stirner's proposed alternative to organized society, by means of which egoists could scuttle the ship of the state and give rise to a state of affairs in which individual autonomy would flourish. This has been necessarily only an extremely brief summon, summation of Stirner's ideas, intended to arouse interest and provide context for the second half of this essay. The broadness and scope of Stirner's thought make him difficult to summarize, and the section could have easily been twice as long. Those hungry for more should refer to the recommended reading list at the end of the pamphlet and in the video description. Everyone will have to decide how much of Stirner they want to take and what to do with it. But as Stirner himself said regarding interpretations of his work, that is your affair, and it does not trouble me. I have set my cause upon nothing. That was a fun part. Section 3. Stirner's Relevance to Anarcho-Communists it is a fact that until relatively recently, most of the anarchists inspired by Stirner weren't communists. In the United States, the most well-known exponents of egoism were Benjamin Tucker and his comrades, centered around the individualist anarchist journal Liberty. Indeed, Tucker was the driving force behind the publication of the first English edition of Stirner's book. However, he has been a significant influence on thinkers more than in the mainstream anarchist tradition. In the 1940s, the anarcho-syndicalists of the Glasgow Anarchist Group made Stirner's ideas the basis of their organizing. They took Stirner's ideas of the union of egoists literally as a way of freely organizing within industry and thus explained syndicalism as applied egoism. The anarcho-communist activist and cartoonist Donald Room was introduced to Stirner by members of this group and has adhered to conscious egoism ever since. Emma Goldman's anarchism was profoundly influenced by thinkers such as ne um, Stirner and Nietzsche. In the introduction to her book, Anarchism and Other Essays, Goldman defends Stirner against shallow and erroneous interpretations, commenting that his philosophy contains, quote, the greatest social possibilities, end quote. Even the younger Murray Bookchin, whose attitude towards German egoism greatly soured later in life, wrote, quote, Stirner created a utopistic vision of individuality that marked a new point of departure for the affirmation of personality in an increasing impersonal world, end quote. So clearly, socially oriented anarchists have been interested in Stirner's ideas. They continue to be interested today, and for good reason. In a world where even revolutionaries too often find themselves lost among enemies of the individual and calls for self-sacrifice, the uncompromising egoism of Stirner is a breath of fresh air. To many communists, while rejecting God the Father, God the State, and God the Corporation, instead set up God the Community, a fearsome deity which Kropotkin called more terrible than any of the preceding. For Stirner, as for the egoistic communist, these are all spooks. The communist egoist does not serve the people, the masses, or any other spook. She serves herself, because she is part of the people, part of the masses. How can humanity be happy when you and I are sad? As the self-described Marxist Sternerists of the Bay Area group for ourselves observed, quote, Any revolutionary who is to be counted on can only be in it for himself. Unselfish people can always switch loyalty from one projection to another. Furthermore, only the most greedy people can be relied upon to follow through on their revolutionary project, end quote. Anarchists who only wish to abolish the authority of the state and of capital but once leave the authority of fixed ideas, like morality, humanity, rights, or altruism intact, only go halfway. For the egoist, these spooks can be even more vicious than the more visible forms of authority. Altruism, living to serve others, is one of the most pernicious superstitions extant in our civilization today. Workers engaged in a terrible altruistic action every day when they labor to enrich the capitalist, who receives simply by virtue of the fact that he has so much already. Women are victims to altruism when they waste away living to serve a man who is nothing but a tiny tyrant over the home. The other crimes that come from altruism are endless, and it's clear to conscious egoists that altruistic socialism is a farce, capable only of transforming authority, but not abolishing it. Egoism encourages individuals to no longer die slowly, giving presence to those who give nothing in return, and from this idea now 
flows the egoist communist desire for insurrection and expropriation. When one applies Stirner's notion of the spook to one of society's most sacred idols, private property, the implications are almost necessarily communist. How many individuals have had their ownness sacrificed and lives ruined by this horrid Moloch? Cerner ridicules the idea of any right to property, as he ridiculed rights generally, pointing out that property is based on might, or one's power to keep it and get it. Private property, alien property, is just another spook, because the entire world is the egoist's property, waiting to be taken. In other words, the communist egoist has it for the object of her appropriation, the totality of life. Stirner hinted at this with his memorable quotation, quote, I do not step back shyly from your property, but look at it as if it was my property, in which I respect nothing. Pray do the like with what you call my property. Stirner likewise attacked such fundamental aspects of capitalist life as the division of labor and even work itself. When everyone is to cultivate themselves into man, condemning a man to machine-like labor amounts to the same thing as slavery. Every labor is to have the intent that the man be satisfied. Therefore, he must become master in it, too, to be able to perform it as a totality. He who in a pin factory only puts on heads, only draws the wires, works as if it were mechanically like a machine, he remains half-trained, does not become a master. His labor cannot satisfy him, it can only fatigue him. His labor is nothing by itself, has no object in itself, it is nothing complete in itself. He labors only in another's hands and is used, exploited, by this other. End quote. In contrast to enforced, degrading, regimented, capitalist work, Stirner juxtaposes egoistic labor, which people would take part in purely from egoism and would provide opportunities for self-realization and self-enjoyment. Such labor might be done alone or in a union of egoists with others, but each participant would remain consciously egoist. Indeed, Stirner recognizes that cooperation was often more satisfying than competition. Quote, Russ's acquisition does not let us take breath, take calm enjoyment. We do not get the comfort of our possessions. Hence, it is at any rate helpful that we come to an agreement about human labor that they may not, under any competition, claim all our time and toil. End quote. Cerner's principal critique of socialism and communism, as they existed in his day, was that they ignored the individual. They aimed to hand ownership over to the abstraction of society, which meant that no existing person actually owned anything. Authoritarian socialism cures the ills of free competition, which Cerner correctly notes was not free, by alienating everything from everyone. This sort of communism was based on community, on society with a capital S, not the union which Stirner desired, a communism that places possessions into the hands of a phantom while leaving nothing for the individual cannot really be much more than a new tyranny. Anarcho-communism can benefit from these egoistic insights, since they serve as a reminder that communism isn't sought for for its own sake, but as a means to guarantee each unique individual self-enjoyment and self-actualization. Understanding Stirner's union of egoists is crucial to understanding his ideas concerning insurrection, and how they can be reconciled with the more mainstream anarchist views of revolution. Stirner rejected revolution in favor of insurrection, in the etymological sense of rising above. Quote, insurrection calls us to no longer let ourselves be arranged, but to arrange ourselves, and set no glittering hopes on institutions. End quote. However, Stirner recognizes the liberatory potential of group action and the interweaving of each egoist's personal insurrection, even commenting on the value of strike action. Quote, the laborers have the most enormous power in their hands, and, if they once became thoroughly conscious of it and used it, nothing could withstand them. They would only have to stop labor, regard the product of labor as theirs, and enjoy it. This is the sense of the labor disturbances which show themselves here and there. The state rests on the slavery of labor. If slavery becomes free, <laughs> the state rests on the slavery of labor. If the labor becomes free, then the state is lost. Stirner urged egoists to unite, not out of any modulant sentimentality or misplaced moralism, but out of a desire to see egoism become generalized in order for each egoist to know the pleasure that can be found in others' truly realized individuals.
The genuinely egoistic individual will never be satisfied of anything less than a universalized egoism. The egoist unites with those who share her interest, and all the exploited and oppressed certainly have a personal interest in putting an end to their oppression. What other anarchists have called social revolution is, to the conscious egoist, a massive interweaving of each individual's personal insurrection, a coming together in a union of egoists to perpetuate what Stoner referred to as, quote, an immense, reckless, shameless, conscienceless, proud crime, the crime of insurrection, of expropriation, of revolution. Quote, Doesn't it rumble in a distant thunder? And don't you see how the sky grows ominously silent and gloomy? End quote. End of the Relevance of Max Stirner's to Anarcho-Communists by Maddie Thomas The last section of text is a recommended reading, which will hopefully be included in the video description. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.